Hello, and welcome to the Rollwise Podcast. My name is Mike, and I'm here with my good friends Brent and Jeff. Uh, Brent, say hi. Hello, everybody. And Jeff, uh, you're new to the podcast. I think it's uh, pretty cool that we were able to get one of our other friends in here that we've also been gaming with for uh, quite some time. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, everyone. My name's Jeff. I've been uh, an avid gamer for most of my life. I started playing role-playing games uh, in grade school with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, good old AD&D. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be partner in a local gaming store uh, for several years in the early 2000s. So I do have some perspective of what it's like to sell these products, uh, which is always very interesting. You get to interact with a lot of really cool people that know a lot more about the games than you do. Um, my favorite game uh, probably still is... You know, old school D and D because that's that's probably got all the memories. But I, uh, since I played with you guys, uh, I've gotten exposed to a lot more systems and realized, you know, there's a lot more to role playing than just dice chucking. Uh, even though I like to chuck the dice every now and then. Hey man, there is nothing wrong with just chucking dice. Um, so that's cool because you know today's episode is actually going to be really fun because we we kind of go into that older school older school D and D not necessarily A D and D because uh, as we discussed on a previous episode A D and D was kind of its own beast right Brent mm -hmm. it <laughs> and, was uh, it was <laughs> yeah it was it was its own thing and so today we're actually going to be talking about Paizo um, Paizo. I think they're Paizo Inc. now, uh, but they uh, Paizo and their game Pathfinder, which was basically, I wouldn't say ripped wholesale from 3.5, but it used so much inspiration from 3.5 D&D that it kind of earned the moniker 3.75. So it was a step away from D&D, &D, but barely. So uh, let's. So I guess let's go ahead and get into this because today we're going to talk about first of all the company, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about creating characters for Pathfinder Second Edition. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start us off with Paizo the company. So what's and this is what this is where I found out that Wizards of the Coast is a, it, maybe they've been a terrible company for a lot longer than I realized. I don't know if they've ever had a, a good period, but I don't know if you guys know, but the the Paizo is actually founded by Lisa Stevens. Um, she she was originally with like White Wolf and stuff like that, and she actually joined Wizards of the Coast, but ultimately was laid off from WotC in 2000. And as I was reading up on this, apparently Wizards of the Coast used to lay people off in December, <laughs> so she got she got laid off during like a Christmas time layoffs. What a terrible bastardly thing to do if you. <laughs> Um, but the good news is she didn't really let that get to her. Uh, and as, I mean, as you kind of read through the histories a little bit, you found out that she had a pretty intense passion for Dungeons and Dragons. And, um, since D and D was actually published by Wizards of the Coast at the time, uh, she basically said, Hey, you know what, if you guys are willing to let somebody else take over for you, uh, we'd be interested. And I didn't, I didn't know that that was actually the case, that you'd just go up to people and be like, hey, if you guys are looking to have somebody else do this, yeah, we'd be going to. Um, but yeah, so she basically did that, and Wizards of the Coast said, hey, sure, we'd be happy to, to basically let you publish these magazines um, instead of us, because comparatively, the Dungeons & Dragons books and everything like that that they were making at the time were far more profitable than the magazine. And I'm not actually sure, but it seems like... You know, if you have a big company that, you know, produces a few different types of gaming products, it seems like the magazines, which people seem to love, at least in spirit, always tend to get cut first. But I don't know if you guys have noticed, have you seen a lot of companies putting out a lot of magazines lately? Like a lot of Patreon seem to have magazines. Like I know um, Matthew Coville, they have Arcadia and they have a few issues of that under their belt. But but it's a it's a is it a is an actual is it an actual printed periodical or is it an easy and like it's an online magazine? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I know for Arcadia, I have the first two issues um, in PDF form, but I don't think I had an option to buy like a physical copy. Because I think what you're starting to see is you're starting a you're you're starting to see a return to those like monthly periodicals um, in easing form. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, I think 
like Dungeons and Dragons, the two magazines that were put out that Wizards put out that it looks like she took over, like they were just physical magazines. Mm-hmm. And there's and what do we know about publishing? There's no money in having a physical product. Oh yeah. Um, like <laughs> and it's it's absolutely amazing too, because it and I didn't know this about publishing, but if you it, like there's a different a few different ways that you can kind of publish. And this is what's interesting about what they were doing is that they were, you know, selling to like hobby stores and they were selling to like newsstands. And so I, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but like, apparently, you know, if you're, if you're selling to like newsstands or something like that, apparently they can just over purchase and then return stuff. <laughs> you don't actually know how much money you made off of, off an issue until later when the dust settles or something like that. That is fucking crazy. Yeah. Back issue. Yeah. You'll get your back issues. Um, yep, yeah. That's where the term comes from is yep. um, sending the back issues back so you didn't have to actually pay for them. And oh. then you try and hawk them somewhere. Oh, I, I think I think newsstands used to just tear the covers off of the old magazines and, you know, kind of like bookstores did with remainders. Uh, the, yeah, publishing is uh, publishing's a rough game. Yeah. Yeah, so what they really wanted, obviously, was to get out of publishing a monthly magazine. Well, yeah. Uh, could... That's what they wanted to do. Um, yeah, which at the time, like 2000, that would be about, that sounds about right for cutting periodicals like that, because that's when like the mm-hmm. internet started to be where you could get e zines and stuff like that. And like, we're seeing, I think you're right. We're seeing a big, big return to like newsletters and e zines, mm-hmm. um, and things like that, which is kind of an interesting, like, yeah, back. I, it, it's, it's nice how it's kind of cyclical. And I think we could talk about that, that a little bit later because I, I think it, it in itself is its own kind of renaissance the top the, because there's it's almost like a deluge of information you almost have to pick and choose your best easings to get now mm-hmm. um but speaking about paizo so you know basically lisa um said sure let's uh go ahead um i'll take over these things and that's when she founded the company paizo publishing um and it paizo i guess it, ha- it has a greek meaning did you guys know this random piece of trivia you know what paizo means in greek no. No. It means I play or to play. So huh, I thought that was rather fitting. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the, the name makes more sense now. It it does. It like actually seems purposeful, which as you look at Paizo's history, it seems like they've had a they've been very clever and very purposeful for a very long time, which is kind of a cool thing about the company. Um, but she didn't start this company alone. She got with a guy named Vic Wirtz and Johnny Wilson, um, and they actually transitioned the staff from Wizards who were working on the magazines at the time for Dungeons & Dragons, and they basically took the staff, they even worked out of the Wizards of the Coast offices um, at the time, and they basically were working there until they could kind of transition them out and kind of get their own thing going. So it was kind of cool that even though Wizards of the Coast totally just said, hey, thanks, but no thanks to Lisa, that they still managed this relationship and kind of spun off this company. And, I mean, as you could tell, I mean, it's, I, I can't imagine today where that would happen, where, like, a company would let you go and they would let you within 100 yards of the building without a pass. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, today it just feels like once you're separated from a company, you're, you're dead to them. <laughs> so. Right, and a possible, like, threat. Yeah. So, uh, well, whatever. So, and so when you look at it, um, you know, they, they actually were working out of the offices and doing all those kind of things. And all in all, they actually started with three different magazines. They started with Dungeon, they started with Dragon, and they also had a license to publish something called Star Wars Insider. Um, did you guys know that? I remember that it existed now that you mention it. Mm-hmm. And I've probably thumbed through a few issues but I don't remember ever actually purchasing any. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I like Star Wars to some degree, but obviously uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't purchase this magazine, but I didn't even know that they published it. Uh, but unfortunately, Star Wars, this magazine was like over half their revenue. <laughs> so it was, the, it was the cash cow for Paizo for at least the, the short term when the company was being founded. And, uh, and it was nice because, you know, as you imagine a new company with a periodical that was being sold, I mean, they were, they were benefiting from the fact that they had the Dungeon and Dragazine and Star Wars insider money that they just had to like, they had to work on making it, you know, their own 
And so from their perspective, they actually turned out to be in a pretty good position, almost right out of the gate with having some strong branded licensing that they, they focused on. Well, yeah, Star Wars is a big license. Anytime mm-hmm. you can get like that yeah. associated, you'll probably make money because Star Wars fans are crazy. Uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, tangentially speaking, you know, I mean, if you if you look at what Disney has been doing with Star Wars, I mean, they've been trying to get as much, you know, money out of that tit as they possibly can. I don't know if you guys heard, but those five thousand dollar themed stays at that Star Wars themed hotel or whatever it is. I think they're reducing the price because I, I think they realized that maybe that might have been a little too much. The, the eight people willing to pay that already stayed there. <laughs> They're they're they are doing how they they're they're foregoing their monthly vacation that they take to uh the Star Wars Cantina. Yeah, like <laughs> I I I didn't go, but I heard that you know you could go in the beginning and it was so empty um for the Star Wars part of the, the Disneyland the, park. The rooms just... looked okay, but I, for five thousand bucks I'm expecting more. That's all I'm saying. Really? I've heard that the Galaxy Edge like thing galaxy's edge i think that's what it's called like thing um was pretty popular really the last few years i mean i think it opened at a bad time didn't it open like yeah i think it i think it opened like at kind of the worst timing but i'm just saying it opened like a cent before covid tried to destroy the world (laughs) (laughs) i mean that'll put a that'll put a damper on any sort of like hey let's go see some wookies i think yeah but they, but they definitely tried to get the most out of the souvenir business, from my understanding. Because admittedly, I did not go and see this. Um, kept, my wife and I had talked about going just because we we're, we both like Star Wars enough, and we know that people's opinions here differ on Star Wars. But we thought, hey, what the hell, it could be fun. And maybe maybe lately, now that the park is like at full capacity, it could just be as busy as ever. But I heard you like made a, a cheap ass lightsaber for like a thousand dollars or something. I could be. A, elaborating or embellishing a little bit there but heard it was much more expensive than you would expect uh i think if you go anything disney you should probably expect to pay a lot of money yeah that's true and long lines from what i understand also true also very. well you have to buy the extra pass to uh cut to the front yeah the pre-pass you have to buy the pre-pass well to skip the line i think they called it fast pass when we were there last time yeah (laughs) that could be the name i mean I haven't been to Disney in uh, many a year, couple of decades. So I have never been to Disneyland, and uh, well, that sounds like a great first vacation post COVID for you, Brent. It sounds like a lot of people to me. That's uh, what it sounds it's, like. To me. It's always a lot of people. <laughs> sounds like it a is. lot of. For some reason, anytime somebody mentions Disneyland, I just get this like a feeling of like sticky and ice cream, like kids running everywhere and it makes me uncomfortable so i think i'm good right. without disney okay. that's fine that's fine <laughs> so okay tangent we we went off on a tangent there not that we hate disneyland or maybe brent hates disneyland i don't know um but back uh, yeah, to i'm okay with the mouse we're not getting paid by the mouse so that is a truthful comment so <laughs> focusing on uh more the the dungeon and dragon magazine or sorry dungeon and dragon magazine um, I didn't really remember this, but did you guys remember that apparently there was a, another magazine that was out there that was the RPGA Polyhedron publication? You guys remember that one at all? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah. I, a lot of the big games had magazines for a while. Um, I remember the Polyhedron magazine. I never, I never, I had a subscription to Dungeons and Dragon at one point, but I never had a subscription to uh, Polyhedron. Well, well, Polyhedron, what was interesting about that is they actually, so Wizards, in their infinite wisdom, decided that since Polyhedron wasn't really doing a lot on its own, I guess, they decided to combine it so that your dungeon magazine was a dungeon and Polyhedron magazine. So it was kind of like this weird <laughs> two issues in one kind of thing. But rather than making it better, it just made it more confusing, I think. Seem, seems kind of like a, it, I mean, it probably had some synergies that it had in there, but you basically had just two magazines that were connected at the back of the, you know, on the spine. And then you just kind of, oh, you're on the dungeon part. Oh, you're on the, the polyhedron part. Yeah, that must have been towards the end because like Dragon, mag- like the Dragon and Dragon and Dungeon or Dungeon and Dragon magazines were interesting because like one was like a mm-hmm. lot of flavor and stories. And then the other one was like stuff for GMs, which was all I thought was kind of neat that they had those split up into yep. two. I mean, they also could charge twice the money, but um it was uh it was kind of a neat magazine mm-hmm. to have 
Yeah. And I, uh, I mean, so in dungeon was the one that was actually focused more on like the adventures and everything like that. Yeah. And dragon was more like the supplemental material. So like you could have new classes, new, um, you could have new, uh, do, you know, advice columns and stuff like that. Like they had the sage advice in there where you could get kind of official answers, D and D questions, they had comic strips, um, you know, that I, and it was, I think there was a ton of different comic strips that existed in those uh, Dragon magazines. I think like, uh, Nice at the Dinner Table was in them at one point, you know, and yep. a few other ones. That's where Nice at um, the Dinner Table started, I think. Oh, uh, maybe. I don't, I, I don't remember where it started. I just remember seeing, I think, a strip in there. I think they also had like something like, like a Dorkness Tower or some shit um, in there as well. Uh, but, they, uh, but you know, it was it was basically they they kind of had two different audiences, right? The gamer, the the players were kind of getting the Dragon magazine, and the the DMs, quote unquote, were kind of getting the Dungeon magazine to a degree, mm-hmm. right? And so, I mean, if you think about it, this is a uh, you know these were two really good magazines, and I I don't think I, you know I never actually had a subscription to them, but I do remember seeing them in the hobby shops to like pick up if I wanted to pick up a copy and all that stuff. Um, they're, at the, they're at the last like it was expense like they were expensive it was like 125 dollars a year or something for like both of them well that's not it's not terrible though if you think about it i mean maybe i maybe this is 2000s money and maybe it, it, it was um yeah it was i mean i was in my 20s i think when i had it and uh so it would have been 2000s and yeah it was it was pretty pricey for and like it wasn't like a pay by the month thing it was like give us all the oh. money up front give us the money now <laughs> <laughs> yeah give us the money now um and so like it was an investment um to get those magazines periodically but they were a fun magazine they were always it was kind of always exciting to get them when they were doing it yeah well and and so it's it's interesting because i mean up until this point for paizo we haven't even really talked about anything about pathfinder and so you can when you look at the history of the company i mean it really didn't even touch like it creating its own role playing system until a few years after its founding. And what I think is kind of neat is that the company and how it reacted to some pretty big events that happened to it um, really, I think, kind of speak to how Paizo has become the the kind of, I would say, powerhouse that it has in the role-playing space. Uh, the first one was, is that uh, apparently when one of the people left from the company, like they lost their ability to publish the Star Wars content, like LucasArts basically took back the license. And so if you imagine imagine having your your business and then all of a sudden half of it is gone. <laughs> so that was a pretty big, uh, you know, a pretty big blow to their, their, their books and everything like that. They did try to like, you know, fill the gap with some additional publications that ultimately failed some additional magazines and stuff like that. Um, they did launch Paizo.com. I think that's when I, the first time I'd actually remembered Paizo was the website that they had. It, I don't think it was that great of a website, but apparently, I mean, they sold a lot of third party stuff on there. And so it was kind of like a gamer hub, kind of like drive through RPG is, um, I don't know when, when did drive through RPG start? Anybody remember? It's been around for quite a while, but I don't remember when they started. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they were like similarly launched or anything like that, but it's just that's the first thing that came to my mind is that Paizo was kind of in a in a similar vein offering third party material as well as their own thing. Um and then uh, 2004 of all the th- is when Drive Through RPG started. Oh, so actually Drive Through RPG was before um Paizo.com, I think in that case. I think Paizo.com was like 2005 or so. Um that's crazy. And and so then the next thing that really kind of hit Paizo in its own little weird way was the fact that uh, Wizards, you know, I mean, Paizo would basically built up this subscription service and they were doing pretty good, you know, with, uh, you know, going online and doing all that stuff. Um, and they had been building these adventure paths and they had been, you know, building their brand quite successfully. Um, you know, I think when they kind of reformulated the magazines and everything like that, um, you know, they had put out adventures like Shackled City, Age of Worms, uh Savage Tide, did you hear about any of those those uh, original kind of? Yeah, I've, names? I've I've heard of those. I haven't. I mean, we didn't play any of them, but yeah, I've heard of those. Well, well I Sh- fucked up Savage Tide. Like I've done that personally. Uh, uh, Shackled City, I've definitely. I think we may have played some of in one of my older gaming groups. Yeah, and so I mean, this is this is of course back mid two thousands or something like that. But I had a gaming group. We tried to run Savage Tide, and I I don't remember how far we got before the the company or the the party turned murder hobo, but. Um, I think it was only two sessions in before all of a sudden everybody was starting to die and stuff was starting to get set on fire and I was having a lot less fun than I expected. <laughs> um, 
but really, I mean, so they, so based, and then after, after they'd kind of built this up, they started building, they'd been doing their official D&D content. Wizards actually clawed the license back. And so, I mean, as you may guess, that sucks. But the nice thing was, is they gave them a year uh, to kind of prepare for the license to come back with them. And in that year, that's when they, that's when they had kind of like put some things that they've been putting to work since 2005 on the table. And that's where you start to get the the genesis of Pathfinder really coming to be. And the so severance, the severing, this the severing. And so, like, I mean, Wizards is it, 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 and like I said, the more I research Wizards, the more crazy as it seems. Is that even though they took back the license for Dragon and Dungeon magazines, they were nice to give them the, uh, you know, to give them the year to like to have that time to print the to print the like the magazine and basically figure out how to like have a viable business going forward and everything like that. Um, they were publishing a lot of other role-playing kit type stuff. Um, and they started publishing like their game mastery modules and stuff like that. Um, but they, uh, they started putting together Pathfinder and, you know, they started introducing people to the world of Galarian kind of like, you know, through the adventures, you know, you start, they started having that, right. Oh, they started publishing in Galarian and all that kind of stuff. So they started building up the world. But what's interesting is I didn't know about this at the same time, but Wizards had also another, like, trademark license out there. Did you ever hear about the D20 tra- system trademark license? Do you remember that? I, yes. Well, so apparently that's what, I think that's what people were afraid of, because I was actually looking at some forums, you know, some RPG net, like .net and stuff like that, forums where they were, you know, those because those are cool kind of time capsules to go back in time. And you could see that this they had the same kind of thing happen with this D20 system trademark license because Wizards clawed that, you know, they revoked that license and it left a whole bunch of people in a shitty place. It was I think one person called it the implosion of the D20 systems <laughs> because all these people yeah. had kind of built these the, this content on that. And then they said, nope, we're going to do that. Um, but at the time, everyone was like, oh, the OGL is irrevocable. And I mean, that was you know, only a few years after the origin, the open game license had been created. So there was, even at that point, everyone felt that OGL, which we were talking about in 2023, uh, was a lot more safe than than the uh, than the D20. Well, well, yeah, and the more and the more you talk about it, like saying, well, they gave them a year. Um, it sounds like a lot of the stuff, the, the decisions that they made over the last, I don't know, month. Um, mm-hmm disaster month uh may have been as a as a like knee-jerk reaction to what originally happened with pathfinder where they mm-hmm. split the community like oh god we don't want to give them a year to get their shit together um yeah. like we did last time <laughs> like that seems like because i mean that's I, and like i said when i like we've talked about before um i think a lot of 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 wizards decisions recently mm-hmm. with the open beta test and everything are really in an attempt to do a litmus test to see if they're going to split their community again they really want to avoid people not going to D one i think and that's and that's and i think that's really what everything has been about and i think mm-hmm. that's where you know where the fumble comes in is well, exactly uh, <laughs> trying to make sure people because like they definitely don't want people con- to continue to make content for f- 5e when they have a new game out because they just created competition for themselves, which is a, mm-hmm. absolutely not what they want. Exactly, and and like the crazy part is, is so then you know Paizo gets everything set up, they put together their game, they launch it in Gen Con in 2009, and by the end of 2010, because around these times, you know, fourth edition was basically the big, the, you know, the big next step for. Dungeons and Dragons is that, you know, I think, I think the people at Paizo basically said, do we have, do we go the route of fourth E or do we do our own thing? And they decided to do their own thing. And by doing that, they basically created Pathfinder, you know, D and D 3.75. And according to what I was reading by the end of 2010, they were outselling fourth edition on their mm-hmm. third party side. And then by the end of like 2011 or so, um, you know, they were, they were, either competing directly or even outselling them in D and D type stuff. So when fourth edition basically said that they were shutting down shop and going to go fifth edition, you know, in 2012, like pretty much Paizo and Pathfinder became like the top dog, if not, you know, if not the top dog. Cause I mean, I don't, I didn't, there were no sales numbers that basically said how many units were being sold or anything like that, but there was like the, the, the 
everyone's opinion as well as what I was able to find is that they pretty much Pathfinder had either matched up or eclipsed D and D at least for a short period. Uh, we all know that that didn't necessarily keep because you know it sounds like Fifth Edition won a lot of hearts and minds back, but yeah. it did. But yeah, um, I mean, yeah, Pathfinder was the the thing because Fourth Edition was so ill received. I guess is the way I would put it. To put it nicely. It was yeah. a game that no one really. I think the reception was okay. I think it, because I remember playing it and I had a good group at the time, but I also remember after about six months going, all of these games feel the same. Like it doesn't matter what we're doing or which character I'm playing. Like it started to feel like a slog. Yeah. Fourth edition really had a, it, it had more of a video game mentality where um, you felt like maybe they were trying to get ready for making an MMO or something, but um, yeah, it definitely wasn't. The, it definitely wasn't as interactive as 3.5, and kind of a, all the everything kind of felt samey. And I think that's where Pathfinder really overtook. Um, like 3.5 was a beloved game. Weirdly enough, like people say, I talk about how it's too crunchy now, or you know, it's like spreadsheet the game, but like people loved it. Um, mm-hmm originally yeah well and i think it i think it kind of was one of those things where you know because there was all this this stuff that went into it you know there was there was tons of different source books there was you go any which direction you wanted it felt um i mean there i did see and i think i think it was uh dungeon magazine or dragon magazine actually had an official conversion for dark sun at a 3.5 which was kind of interesting i didn't know that i don't think i I don't think I had a, a group playing Dark Sun in three five per se, but um, an official one? yeah, I thought so. I thought I read that I was just going through this. I'll look yeah. it up for you because I'll. There was a there was a there was a, an official fourth edition Dark Sun, mm-hmm. but I didn't know they did a, a. I mean, it would make sense if they did trying to get some of that money. But... Well, it was it was it was official in so much that I think it was published through either Dungeon or Dragon magazine, right? So, I mean, it, oh, and those yeah, were yeah. the official those are the official magazines for Wizards even though they weren't publishing them. So, yes, I do I do have and I actually do have those. They did have those, you're correct. Yeah, they so. have a probably a 10-page spread in each magazine about mm-hmm. Dark Sun and um and like stats and stuff for uh the races or so. species now, I guess. Ancestry. Ancestries, ancestry species, God, what ancestry? I think ancestry. By the way, I will just say that about Pathfinder. I do think calling it ancestry is probably much better, a much better choice. But uh, wizards can't use it, which I think is kind of funny. Yeah, they they lost they they lost that race to change away from race, whatever. Um, so yeah, so that I mean that's kind of the story leading up till now. I mean, obviously they they started putting out Pathfinder, that became their main cash cow. They they put out Starfinder, which is they've stuck to. You know, they've put out the you know a space bearing game, and I know we played a little bit of Starfinder, didn't get too far into it. Um, but from what I read, it was a it was an interesting take on kind of a future sci fi setting. Uh, there was at one point. Um, and just it recently shut down, but they had actually had an MMO for Pathfinder. Did you guys know that? I didn't know that. Was that based off of the same engine as their, uh, as their, um, their one game that you played? Uh, no, I think it's, I think it was something entirely different. Cause I looked at some, uh, screenshots for it and all that kind of stuff. Cause obviously cause they said they had an MMO and I was like, who's it? Was it? <laughs> I, I knew they produced it. I haven't actually ever talked to anybody who played it, and I yeah. didn't. Yeah, so I I couldn't tell you how good it was. I don't think it was very well received because I think I think what happened was is that it was like a non AAA studio putting together this MMO, and it just never really it never really got off the ground really well. And from some articles that I saw back in 2017 about it, is that it seemed like it was kind of plagued with development issues, and then Pizer decided to take over production, but then. As Lisa had mentioned, she was like, "Well, we got a small, scrappy team doing this to find its niche and uh, or niche." And I was like, "What does that mean in terms of an MMO?" Well, it's also, I mean, MMOs at that time were like it was like, "Do you offer something different than World of Warcraft?" No, you're probably not going to make it very, very far. Well, at least comparable to World of Warcraft in some way, right? But I, the screenshots that I saw for Pathfinder, I don't think represented that 
that same era because you know i mean world of warcraft's been around since what 2003 2004 and i mean it's it's updated itself to be still that's kind of unique style but i think by 2017 if you were kind of going more with like a realistic look you had some pretty big games you were competing with um i mean i more more mmos have died than have lived that's that's all i'm gonna say um uh yeah uh although dungeons and dragons online is still going apparently is it apparently jesus well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be doing that fuck those guys but i believe that uh i believe that it works off the 3.5 engine by the way oh <laughs> so there well, you go. maybe 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 not maybe i'll maybe i'll support them depends on if wizards get any money from me that way or not it might be so. free to i think it might be free to play these days it's a pretty <laughs> old it's a pretty old mmo free to play with with microtransactions well, maybe i don't know i believe i played it for like half an hour once uh mm. before i was like yep this is an mmo i don't play these anymore because they're kind of boring <laughs> yeah they do they do break your brain a little bit so so yeah that's paizo um i have to say that as a company like they they seem like a scrappy little underdog and it it seems like at various points in their history, they've made really good decisions that happen to be the right decision, not only for the time, but also set them up for some pretty good future success. So, you know, like the fact that they, you know, didn't rely on the D20 system, you know, trademark and all that stuff and went with the OGL instead. And the fact that like right now, they're kind of like reinserting themselves into the conversation and they reinserted themselves in such a fantastically brilliant marketing way. Um, and as I told you guys earlier, I've got my book. Um, your local game store may have a book if you're lucky, but you know, as we said, I think the stat was they sold like eight months of books in two weeks or something stupid. So more success to them. Hope they can celebrate with some champagne. Yeah. I might try and pick up one, uh, a physical copy of the book. Uh, at some point I did buy a PDF, um, just to make sure I had it. Mm -hmm. um and uh but i'll probably you know me i prefer to have physical copies so i'll probably pick up one um when they're available um because yeah i collect role-playing books so and and they're good and they're good so that's it that's the introduction to paizo so um that was kind of the section i wanted to run through and just kind of for people that are listening to know a little bit about this cool company um they were they were pretty interesting starting off as a publisher ending up as a you know, a fairly big player in the RPG world um, is pretty neat. And I'm glad that they were able to do that. Uh, so I'm going to have Brent take over on this next section uh, because we wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background and like how to build characters in this and like kind of start to think about that. Because, uh, you know, right now, as you guys are aware, we're, we're playing a little bit of Asin. We've got some mysteries going on. I'm trying not to kill their characters and both Jeff and Brent is, are in the games. And so we have a current mystery that we're running that we can't talk about yet. Um, but once we're done kind of transitioning through some of that free league game, uh, we're going to go over to Pathfinder and we may play through one of the adventure paths or at least a portion of it just to get a sense as to how well Pathfinder second edition plays by some of the other stuff that we've, uh, we've tackled in the past. So more on character creation, probably coming soon. Yeah. What, uh, what I kind of thought we could do today is, um, I'd kind of hit the high points of character creation for Pathfinder. Um, kind of some of the differences from, uh, D and D five E some of the stuff that I think is interesting, the choices that they made um, in the character creation kind of background. And then like you said, um, later down the road, we'll actually make a few characters on the podcast. So you can kind of see how um, it kind of works um, and what kind of characters that we'll be playing in whatever adventure that uh, Mike decides to try and kill us with. Um, so uh yeah, how much did you, um, did Jeff or Mike, did, have you either of you um, reviewed anything about the characters, the character creation? Just out of curiosity. Well, so um, I, so I, I got the book today, uh, and then I immediately had some Indian food with some family members. So <laughs> my my look at second edition is um, looking at the swanky cover, um, which it's a pretty badass dragon, you know. Uh, the art is beautiful. Uh, I love, uh, one of the things I will always say is, um, I love Pathfinder goblins and the character design on the goblins is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty, honestly, the, if you've made characters in Dungeons and Dragons before, um, the Pathfinder system isn't going to probably throw you too much for a loop. 
Um, there is one big difference that I think is interesting um, that I noticed uh, right away as I was reviewing how making a character works. Um, mm -hmm. It's the ability scores. Um, Pathfinder default Pathfinder suggests that you don't roll for your stats. Um, okay. It actually suggests that you do. Um, you actually get your. Um, they call them boosts, ability score boosts. Yeah, ability score boosts um, through your ancestry, through your class, and through your background. Okay. So um, one of the first things that it does is it has everybody's ability scores start at 10, um, because that's human average. Um, or, yeah, human average. They use the term human average, too. So, and then what you do from there, so you have all of your stats set at a 10. And then what you do from there is um, you kind of, as always, you kind of figure out what kind of, what kind of what your concept for your character is. Mm -hmm. um, and then you choose your ancestry, which the ancestry is what they have gone to on to call um, the different, what are now called species um, in D and D in D and D. Um, the ancestry, the ancestry is being, um, it looks like there's five of them. There's dwarf, elf, gnome, goblin, halfling, and human. Um, and then from there, you go to um, your background, um, which I didn't get too much into the backgrounds. Um, I think they're, the, one of the things that I did think was interesting, I didn't get to read like that much into what the different backgrounds are. I'm still kind of studying on that. But one of the things that is interesting is um, how much 5e or what, how much for not one D and D they're trying to take kind of from what Pathfinder did, where your background gives you another free stat boost, um, and kind of chain, you know, kind of decides where your character came from. Mm. Um, so that's interesting. And then there's classes, uh, which it looks like there are 12 classes in total. Um, the one differing from D and D being the alchemist, mm. um, which is kind of their take on, uh, the alchemy school, in the artificer um it's a little bit different but similar um and then you have the basics barbarian bard um you also have a champion uh because um that's what they have for their paladin it looks like um champion mm -hmm. um and then the basic classes and then the big other biggest thing that is different um of course and this is back to the days of uh uh 3.5 and i think the probably the part that make people the most concerned when they look at a Pathfinder character is um, feats. Um, Pathfinder does use the feat system that 3.5 did to strongly like customize your character. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you get a feat almost at every single level of your character. Um, and then you can choose from racial feats or um, like class feats. And they basically customize how your character plays. Um, like if you want to be a um, rock dwarf or a forged dwarf, they all have different feats you can take um, that'll kind of customize how you proceed. Um, they change, you give you some basic ability differences and maybe some different stat boosts. Um, so it's really similar, but different in kind of its regard to how to make the characters. Um, I really like, um, I really like how, they use ancestry um and the backgrounds i feel like i feel like this is what one D, D wants to kind of copy um and i think some of the channels that we've listened to in the past that have talked about like what one D, &D should do um the reason they say that is because this system seems pretty pretty good i mean it's pretty interesting it's very involved for making your character yeah well and I think I don't think that's bad to necessarily give some sort of mechanical application to different components because I I think you have those two different types of approaches right, and if you have something that's kind of mechanic heavy, which I mean at least looking at the character sheet for a Pathfinder character feels like there's a lot of a lot of different components to it, and you know from a just a complexity in character sheet it looks very com you know, complex as opposed to maybe a more narrative driven game, which isn't going to have so many little tiny, you know, ticks and numbers and different areas to focus on. And I, I can't say that it's necessarily more complicated than your current fifth edition D and D sheet, but I, at least it feels like there's a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more you have to kind of focus on. 
And I mean, especially when you start looking at just the upper left-hand corner, you get like the key, you know, you see like there's a single action, a two action activity, a three action activity, a free action, a reaction. Oh my God, I'm already lost, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It looks, it looks a lot more complex. And I think that's one of the things that 5e did is they did streamline this a little bit. But I think um, this is an example of one of those games that does you do a lot up front for ease of play later down the road. Yeah. Um, you you put a lot of like you write a lot of numbers down, you put a lot of feats down, and kind of what the description is. But once you start, once you have all that stuff up front, mm -hmm. it kind of eases into play. Um, that's the big difference between like five uh, e and pathfinder and those and games like that and like a lot of the old school renaissance games like the old school renaissance games are like um like for example troika which we've talked uh, before um troika is like three stats it's like mm -hmm. roll your skill roll your luck roll your stamina um and that's it um which means the difference is 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 like how like one of the things that i think is different about both pathfinder and dd &D, and i think in looking at kind of the difference between the characters of games that I've been looking at recently, which are more narrative storytelling games like Troika and Morkborg and stuff like that, is that combat is going to be a bigger part of your game in um, Pathfinder and D&D, and so there's going to be more rules around it um, to try and make it a little bit more strategic, like how you use a feat or how you use a spell, versus something like, again, I'll use Troika as an example, which is, you know, what do you want to do? Okay roll your you know roll 2d6 add your skill add your advanced skill do you beat the other guy's roll yes mm -hmm. okay what happens um whereas you're going to have more of that upfront thinking done a little bit for you like if you have some sort of weapon feat or something like that um you know that you'll have kind of a description baked in of what your character is doing um and i think that's and i think that can look daunting but i don't think i think once you get past the 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 this spreadsheet the game idea i think it would be pretty easy because again i remember playing 3.5 and it didn't seem that daunting at the time um and i don't feel like pathfinder would be the same way i I think it just takes a little bit of looking and running through a like once or twice um and i think you'll probably be fine and I do think one of the other things I will say about the boost system that they have for the core stats is mm -hmm. you're going to have more variation than I think in 5e um, because in 5e, I, most of the time now what people do is they just take one of the arrays, the standard arrays, mm -hmm. um, yep. and they just take that and then add all their stuff. Um, and so you have a lot of people that start from the same place. Um, and I think in Pathfinder, it kind of for the pathfinder character creation kind of forces you to think about it a little bit more hey brent in uh you know post pandemic when we had a lot of new people getting into the games do you think that a uh, character creation system like pathfinders makes character creation take longer do you think newer players would find it more daunting than some of the other systems out there where you know there's a little bit more focus on quick play or at least, you know, getting into stuff a little bit faster. I can see a new player definitely being um, like, if you, if you set the character sheet in front of somebody who's never played a role playing game before and like, we're going to make a character. Um, it's going to be like having somebody look at Excel and being like, okay, we're going to make a spreadsheet. Um, and their nose is going to bleed and it's going to be really daunting. Um, so yes, it looks more complicated, especially like I said, from, if they have um if they've played osr games which are the the simpler like like i said troika is three stats it's 2d6 and you know pretty easy to do so this is going to look much more daunting than that but i think if you have a good gm who can help walk you through the steps i think the first time you might run into some questions and it may take a little longer but i think after doing that a few times you're probably going to have a pretty easy time um just because you'll start to get used to those those decisions um and one of the things i think that's neat about a slightly more complicated um character generation is it gives you a lot of time to think about what you want your character to do and be like mm -hmm. where you put the numbers is going to matter a little bit more than than say troika um which troika your character is almost completely going to depend on how you play the character versus any of the skills or anything that it has um 
uh some of those Norton like narrative storytelling games are much more um like improv storytelling than say a classic D D game. Sure. No, well, I I I look I look forward to learning down the road when we do that. But uh thanks. I just I've just played with so many more newer people in the last few years that some things that I think we seem to take for granted, you know, like oh. this is just part of the stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Um, a hundred percent. Uh, it would be daunting at first when I opened up the book. Um, even I was a little confused cause I was like, Oh, how do you, how do you determine your stats? Cause I couldn't find, I was like looking for a point by system or, and then I saw the optional like roll for your stats thing. So I had to like sit down and kind of buckle down and really read it. Um, and there are times where like, if you're a new player, you're going to, you're going to ask them, you know, well, you have to decide, do you want to put your free boost in strength or dexterity? And then you're going to kind of have to tell them, you know, what they do. Um, so it is, it is, it is a more complicated system because it expects, it is more crunchy than some of the newer systems. It's more crunchy than your, your, um, your Vason narrative system, your, your Troika 2d6 system, or like, um, uh, player played by the apocalypse, um, Powered by the Apocalypse games, um, because it is it is a D and D game that kind of depends on that sort of meatiness to make the tactical interactions and combat more interesting. Well, and and what's interesting to me about this is that I mean, first of all, the book is huge. Like once you get that physical copy, it is it is heavy. It's it several hundred. Yeah, it is several hundred pages. But the nice thing is, is that even though it's only ten dollars more than the PHB for D and D right now it it does include a DM section so it if you do sit down and try to read it like I think that's that might be the the mistake is if somebody were just to try to read the book straight up they'd be like oh my god I'm never gonna get to the end of this book if you were trying to make a character without somebody who's experienced with the game I would say you would probably give up I will it, I will say that um, whereas there are a lot of the old school Renaissance games. If you picked them up and somebody read the rules a couple times, they could probably make a character. Yeah. So, so I think that this game, if if you have never played a, an in depth game like Pathfinder or something like that, I really would encourage that you know you have a group of people like if you had a situation like you know me, Brent, and Jeff, you know you could sit down and you could read it together and kind of just hammer at the process and be like hey hey you know what let's let's try to make these characters and go through their step by step because i i do know that they have a step by step like here's step one here's step 10 i think they have yes. 10 different steps it, and i think they even give you in like an example as to how the different characters yeah. are generated so yes nice. they do they do have a step by step the, the, the actually that was one thing that i wanted to comment on thank you for reminding me um like is the organization of the book is very nice mm -hmm. um like it's very it's pretty easy to navigate from through character creation um because it's all basically right there as you go through it um whereas others other books kind of have they like jump around like pick mm -hmm. your class pick your background well i don't know my background do i pick my class before my background um you know things like that so i will say that that is one thing that i think it does very well um, it is organized very well. The step-by-step -step character creation is very good. And then, like you said, it does very well with the example of character creation too. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would suggest to anybody, if you are like you too pick up Pathfinder, um, I would be fascinated to find out if people these days, like there are people that have never played a role killing game that are going out there and just scooping up the Pathfinder book and, and trying to make a character by themselves. Um, so if anybody had, does, please, um, comment because i would like to hear a little bit more about that story but um if if you're doing that i strongly suggest um look online there's a bunch of different resources beyond us that you can use to um that will help you make characters um as well as um, there's character generator online um it looks kind of nice i haven't looked at that very much but there are um especially since the boom uh a pathfinder boom that happened over the last couple months I'm not gonna say why um, there have been a lot of videos um, talking about, you know, character creation in Pathfinder. Does it mm -hmm. look daunting? Yes, but I don't. I don't think it's as daunting as it looks at first. Um, especially if you played a, a role playing game before. Um, but it is one that I can see it looking daunting um, at the beginning. Um, but I mean, leveling. I mean, in leveling up also would look daunting because you still have you have a lot of skill selections to make mm -hmm. um, and feats. Um, and really, the meat of the game 
is in the feats. Like that's what really makes Pathfinder, I think, a lot different than Five E. Hmm. Yeah, because I and and I guess one other comment I would say is that you know it, the the interesting thing to me is always that if you have a, a narrative heavy play style you can always lean into the mechanics and all that kind of stuff for a game but if you and it gets like in a mechanic heavy game like pathfinder you know you can always go you can switch gears and go oh we're going from kind of like the heavy narrative style role playing to now we need to rely on a lot of these rules and actually you can kind of seamlessly transition between the two of them it's not like just having this huge book means you have to use all the rules when you're you're playing a game right it can just kind of give you the the skeleton right. by play why but yeah. the one thing about narrative games is you can they they never add more rules for you to play you know you're, you're gonna have to adjudicate in the in the moment or it may not have sections that are well defined because you know it, it wasn't the focus of the game design for that particular game so yeah the focus of most narrative games like again i i know i brought troika up a lot but it's um one that i've been reading quite a bit of lately um like troika is very much a you know do kind of whatever you want and and the and then then it's on the gm to kind of adjudicate how that's going to happen whereas because this wants to be a game that's a little bit more tactical with the non-role-playing elements um like combat or how mm. skills work like yeah it's going to be a little bit more heavy in that that thing but i mean dice as always dice dice help the story along and that's really the focus of it um it's just kind of a different way of of the mechanics are there because they expect kind of a different outcome. Like I said, combat's going to be a bigger part than um, I think combat's going to be a bigger part in any D and D or Pathfinder type game than mm. a purely narrative game um, like Troika or like Mor Morkborg is. You're going to have combat, but it's I mean, fifty percent of the time you're probably going to die in that combat. So, um, so you know, just fifty. If you can, if you can, if you can talk yourself, if you can talk your way out of it, it's probably best to, uh, to do so. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. Well, no, cool. I think, I mean, honestly, I'm kind of excited to play it because I mean, first of all, it seems like the people that have been playing Pathfinder second edition, um, those of, those of my friends that I do know that have played it in the past, uh, spoke well about it, especially during its release. I mean, that, that of course makes them the old guard by comparison to us people kind of giving it a try now in 2023, but um, I do like the the concept of the you know ancestry and and kind of how the 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 backgrounds play into that uh, because it, it it it's funny to me because you know it, when I I think they were talking about one D and D it's like I mean based on what <laughs> you know I was reading about Pathfinder at least hearing people were making a lot of comparisons between the two so I'm almost kind of curious if like at the end of this one D and D is like yeah we're we're published under the Orc license and um, you can find all of our <laughs> all of our mechanics here, uh, and uh, you know, not to say that we carbon copy, but it just it just feels like two people basically stomping in the same pool. Um, okay, so uh, so I guess with that being said, um, Brent, uh, did you, was there any other comments you'd like to make about character generation for this, or any other comments about the Pathfinder system is, in general? Uh, because I think that in terms of like getting started with Pathfinder, I mean. The cool thing about Pathfinder is that they have been very open with their gaming system and everything like that. Um, it's my understanding that even if you can't afford the, um, you know, the the actual, um, like some of the, you know, like some of the stuff they have, like monsters of, are available at like piezo.com forward slash prd and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? They have like some system reference documentation and stuff that they can that they provided. Um, as a way for you to kind of, you know, get into the game without necessarily having to get too deep into the game. Because they're just like D and D, Pathfinder does have a lot of books, and it can be an, a huge investment if you wanted to purchase all of those. Um, so I don't know if necessarily that's what people are, you know, I guess looking to do right away. I would probably get the, the maybe the book and maybe an adventure path to start. Um, you know, just maybe go to Paizo.com or something like that and pick something up and kind of start. And then if you really like the game, you know, then go whole hog by what you by what you want to get to, you know, fill out your library and stuff like that. Uh, but I'd have to say that, um, you know, it, it, just like D&D is right now, you don't have to necessarily invest a lot of money just to get started. You can use a lot of the system reference stuff, I believe, to get into it. Rather yeah, than I, su I suggest not 
uh, buying a bunch of stuff until you're sure that it's a game that you're interested in because yeah. um, there is a lot of resources out there and you could pay a lot out of pocket to have uh, books that you never use. For example, I think I have 10 fourth edition D and D books, um, which I don't need or want, but can't get rid of because oh. I won't burn them. So maybe that's what we'll do is we'll have a, you know, Brent's library giveaway and we'll be giving away fourth <laughs> edition. We we'll either be giving away books that are like interesting, you know, like new, new books, or we'll be giving away one of your fourth edition books to what, what a prize. It's it sounds like Brent's books are in mint condition though, guys. So they may be something that you want if you're a true collector. The funny thing is, I don't think they're all mine. I think uh, I think some of my gaming group bought them and then just like left them here. And they're like, yeah, we don't we don't we don't need these anymore, Brent. You can have these. So I have yeah, I have like I think I have like two cop two or three copies of the core books. Oh well, if somebody wants to start a fourth edition game, don't be afraid <laughs> to uh, hit us up on on social media. It's- Please. supplies are limited uh i would uh i would uh, you know i i would give them away i would uh for the price of shipping if you would like to take some fourth edition books uh you can have them because i have a problem with throwing books away so order yes. that's what you are brand order uh of books kind of yeah i'll I'll, yeah. I'll i'll wear it so Alrighty. Well then I think that at this point, um, next week's, uh, next week's episode is going to be a little bit of a mystery. You know, we'll be, t- we'll be finding something to chat with and keep you guys uh, on top of and everything like that. Uh, but otherwise I think, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed your introduction to Paizo as a company and uh, a little bit of talk about the very, very beginnings of building up a character. And I'm, I'm excited to, to get this stuff forward uh, to get kind of, put our own stuff forward about how we build some characters for one of the upcoming adventure paths. Um, but yeah, uh, Brent, do you want to close us out for the day and then let us know about the socials, all that stuff. And we'll, we'll talk to everybody next week. As always, you can find us on all of different social uh, media. You can find us on Twitter, uh, under Rollwise, Instagram under Rollwise, and YouTube under Rollwise. You can always email us at rollwiseguys at gmail.com. And as I always like to say, uh, Please, everyone out there, roll well and roll wise. And scene.